On this week in Enterprise Tech, we talk about how Facebook is actually worried about some of the new privacy settings coming to iOS 14. Plus, this year has been nothing short of strange. It's actually forcing shifts in the market and actually changes in some of the roles out there, especially CISOs. Curtis will take us through that. Plus, availability is super important to customers. Well, Salesforce thought so as well. And today we have the Chief Availability Officer of Salesforce, Darren Deacon, on the show to talk about reliability and all the challenges organizations are facing around it. Shouldn't miss it. Twyatt on the set. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure, even when they're working remotely. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Twit. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 408, recorded August 28th, 2020. May the Salesforce be available to you. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Salesforce Service Cloud. Salesforce Service Cloud is the world's number one customer service platform that empowers organizations to deliver service from anywhere, from home, in the office, or in the field. Go to bit.ly slash Salesforce for service to find out more. And by Security Scorecard. Security Scorecard helps enterprises manage digital threats with a 360-degree view of cybersecurity health through a single pane of glass. To learn more and sign up for your free account, visit securityscorecard.com slash twit. And by Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Thinking about moving your data storage to the cloud? Wasabi is enterprise class cloud storage at one-fifth the price of Amazon S3 and faster than the competition with no fees for egress or API requests and no complex storage tiers. Start a free trial at wasabi.com and enter code ENTERPRISE. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreski, your guide through this big, giant world of the enterprise, but I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field, starting with our very own geek in paradise. He's the packing mogul, Mr. Brian Chi. Now, Chibert, the last I heard, it's finally the end of an error. Yep. I actually shut down my private network, reset my firewall and and SSL VPN appliance to factory, and handed it to my ex-students who are going to pick up the torch and continue doing testing and teaching at Leeward Community College. So, end of an era. Well, so our uh, our 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 chat room is actually wondering: uh, Have you uh, did you find maybe even a little bit of uh, Jimmy Hoffa in that uh, pile of stuff there? You know, I found everything else. I've still got a few more crates to move. So, you know, maybe Mr. Hoffa is hiding in some corner <laughs> along with, you know, some, you know, old CDs. I, You know, it's horrible. I actually felt so bad getting rid of my old MSDNAA um, CDs and DVDs. It's end of an era. <laughs> definitely is. Definitely is. Well, thanks for being here. Well, speaking of effort, experts, he's our favorite security and enterprise journalist, and he's also a senior editor over there at Dark Reading, Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, how are you, my friend? How's the great state of Florida? Well, we managed to avoid all of the tropical storms and hurricanes that came through, so we're in pretty good shape. Now I'm uh, continuing to look into the world of cybersecurity, and uh, fortunately for me, there's no shortage of of material to keep writing about. That's right. Now, Interop is at the front door, right? When when is that coming up? Interop will be coming up at the end of September, uh, virtually from Austin, Texas, and uh, some really interesting stuff coming out. Uh, I've been talking to the folks running the Interop Labs. Uh, They've got some fascinating uh, demonstrations coming up, lots of good sessions about enterprise networking and, of course, enterprise network security. So um, we are deep in getting ready for that. Thanks, Curtis. Well, speaking of gearing up, it's been a busy week in the enterprise, so we should get started. Facebook is always a topic for people when it comes to privacy. Well, they're warning their developers that privacy changes are coming to iOS and 
might severely curtail its ability to track users' activity across the entire internet. That might be bad for their ad business. We'll talk about it. Now, this year has been nothing short of strange, and it's forcing changes in all parts of the market, including redefining some roles out there, especially the CISO's role. Curtis will get into that. Plus, availability is important to all customers as a critical way to ensure business as usual. Well, Salesforce thought so as well. And today, we have the new chief availability officer from Salesforce, Darren Deacon, on the show to talk about reliability and all the challenges organizations face around it. Now, Salesforce is an advertiser today, but we couldn't pass up the opportunity to talk about the new role and what it means for the industry. But before we get to all those exciting things, we have to also dump, jump into this week's blips. Now, distributed denial of service attacks are some of the most extensive availability and security concerns facing customers moving their applications to the cloud. Now, you know what a DDoS attack is. It attempts to exhaust application resources, making the application unavailable to legitimate users. Now, it's relatively simple type of cyber attack, actually. It's a broad array of computers that all try to connect to an online service at once, overwhelming its capacity. Now, they often use devices compromised by malware, and the owners do not know they're actually being part of the attack. Now, these attackers can target any endpoint that's publicly reachable through the Internet. Well, this past week, it was the New Zealand Stock Exchange that was hit with one. Now, due to the massive attack causing network connectivity issues, trading actually was halted on Tuesday. It was brought back on Wednesday, only to be suspended for a second time. It hit again. Now, the second attack was actually had stopped trading for a large chunk of the working day, but... Despite all the interruptions, the exchange was up at the cl- actually up at the close of the business near its all-time high, actually. Now, there was some warnings before the attack, actually. So this is pretty interesting. A New Zealand cybersecurity organization, CERT-NZ, issued an l- alert back in November about this. It actually said that emails were being sent to financial firms threatening DDoS attacks unless a ransom was paid. doesn't seem like it was paid because the emails claimed to be from a well-known Russian hacking group, fancy bear, but Sir NZ said at the time the threat had never been carried out beyond a 30-minute attack as a scare tactic. Well, it seems they were real, and the fancy bear at the resources had the resources to carry out the attack as promised. Now, our guest later will talk about availability and the importance of it, because only a well-planned virtual network and a good software design designed for that type of thing can provide defense against DDoS attacks. Now, it might be time for the New Zealand Stock Exchange to start considering the good designs. Well, in the latest rankings, China may be the world's leading cyber power. Threat intelligence firm Insight states in its latest report that the Chinese government has broadened both its techniques and its strategies, which, along with its aggressive operations, has made the country perhaps the world's top cyber power. China's aggressive approach to using cyber operations to achieve political and national aims has set its cyber strategy apart from the more cautious and considered approaches of most other nations. The U.S. government has already designated China as the nation's top cyber adversary, and Chinese cyber attackers will likely continue to expand their scope of targets. In the past, the U.S. and European targets bore the brunt of cyber attacks from China-linked groups, but increasingly attacks are driven by the country's ambitions elsewhere. India, Australia, and specific cultural and religious groups have suffered numerous attacks in the past few years. Wicked Panda, or APT-41, is emblematic of the rise in China's cyber operations capability. While the group, whose earliest activity dates back to 2012 and possibly 2008, originally focused on espionage campaigns, there has generally been a financial component to its attacks as well. Overall, the group exhibits significant technical capabilities using 150 different malware components from almost 50 code families. The report says, quote, The goal is simple. Break down trust in democracies, disrupt election cycles, or manipulate democratic election results and gain economic advantage over adversaries to advance global position and power. So my story is about Another oops, a Chrome feature is creating an enormous load on the global root DNS servers. Basically, Google is doing to DNS what D-Link once did to NTP. The Chromium browser, open source upstream parent to both Google Chrome and the new Microsoft Edge, is getting some serious negative attention for a well-intentioned feature that checks to see if a user's ISP is hijacking non-existent domain results. The intranet redirect detector, 
which makes spurious queries for random domains statistically unlikely to exist, is responsible for roughly half of the total traffic of the world's DNS, root DNS servers receive. VeriSign engineer Matt Thomas wrote a lengthy a AP Nick blog post outlining the problem and defined its scope. So just like when our friends at D-Link hard-coded an NTP server into their firmware, it seems Google's hard-coding with this new feature to top-level DNSs is doing an unintentional DDoS attack on those same servers. Now, this next story sounds like spy games with a sprinkle of corporate espionage in there. Now, ransomware is on the rise, and combining that with social engineering techniques like buying off people means organizations have a lot to work on to protect themselves. Now, this last week, the Justice Department released a complaint that described a pre or prevented a malware attack against an unnamed company in Sparks, Nevada. Now, I bet you can guess what that company is, right? Well, to give you a hint... Tesla has a factory in Sparks and makes batteries, packs, and electric motors. <laughs> now, as a confirmation of the attack that it was Tesla, they, several blogs reported the issue, but then Elon Musk took to social networking to actually call it out and prove it. Now, you may be wondering how the attack played out. Well, according to the Justice Department, a Russian national, Igor Khrushchev, 27, actually attempted to recruit and bribe a Tesla employee to introduce malware in the company's network. An unnamed employee at the Tesla factory known as the Gigafactory met with that person who actually allegedly offered to pay him $1 million to introduce malware into the corporate network. Now, the company informed Tesla, good thing, which then notified the Federal Bureau of Investigations. Now, the FBI used the employee in a sting operation. Definitely sounds like a new movie's coming soon. Now, the plan was foiled and the attack never happened. But it just goes to show you that security is more than just systems in place. It means you also have to educate your users and protect against yourself. Well, a vulnerability tsunami is overwhelming security teams. Vulnerability disclosures for 2020 are on track to meet or surpass the number disclosed in 2019, researchers report, and the timing of these bug disclosures could prove risky and stressful for security teams. Risk-based security's VulnDB team aggregated 11,121 vulnerabilities during the first half of this year. Trends indicate the numbers are returning to normal after dipping in the first quarter of 2020, albeit with a few significant factors quickly driving them up. One of these is the occurrence of disclosures by Microsoft and Oracle on the same day. These events have been called um, responsible for 818 flaw disclosures or 7.3% of the total count for 2020. Researchers call these coincidences vulnerability Fujiwara, and they are rare. Two occurred in 2015. The next two will occur in 2025, a conclusion made based on predictable patch releases by the biggest vendors. With that in mind, this year has brought three of them on January 14th, April 14th, and July 14th. While Patch Tuesday started with Microsoft, other companies soon followed. Adobe began releasing patches on the same day in 2012. Since then, SAP, Siemens, and Schneider Electric have joined. Sometimes, other vendors, such as Apple, Mozilla, Intel, and Cisco, will release fixes on the same day. On April 14th, for example, 506 new vulnerabilities were reported, 79% of which came from seven vendors. July 14th saw 491 disclosures with 67% from Microsoft and Oracle alone. Another factor driving the shift is where researchers disclose. 20 years ago, every flaw went through a couple of mailing lists or websites. Now researchers are challenged to track the many blogs, GitHub repositories, and other sources where the many new flaws are shared. Well, we heard... Curtis talk about managing to sidestep some tropical storms and hurricanes. But Hurricane Laura was a pretty big deal. And it certainly left their mark on the Gulf Coast. And now that heavy weather has our attention, I'd like to remind folks that terrestrial communications lines take a beating during hurricanes with high winds and flooding. So might I suggest that you consider quickly getting yourself something like what I have. I have a Garmin InReach. It's a satellite SMS handheld. Um, 
or even a true satellite phone. Um, those are actually getting quite a bit less expensive. And if you use them as part of your data center emergency kit, it means you won't get cut off if the terrestrial lines get slammed. So there's nothing quite like a monster hurricane to really get make enterprise planners quake in their boots. And as a current Hawaii resident and future Florida resident, you had better believe I've got a set of fresh batteries and my iridium phone and such in my hurricane bug out kit. My final comment is this is certainly the year 2020 for bad news. Indeed. Well, privacy is a challenge initiative in lots of organizations. Now, with new compliance rules and models with the world worried about their data, more privacy has become a major topic in the focus of discussion. Now, Google is normally part of this discussion, and new information has surfaced in a lawsuit involving Google's data collection and location tracking practices, including statements by the company's own engineers that its privacy settings are confusing to both users and employees. Oh. Now, Attorney General Mark Brunovich office sued Google in May, accusing the company of deceiving users about when and how it tracked the locations and continued following them even after they tried to opt out. Now, in a version of the lawsuit that was made public with additional sections redacted or unredacted, multiple Google employees acknowledged the issue. Now, they felt Google's privacy settings and design choices made it difficult for users to opt out of location tracking. Now, one employee said the user interface, quote, feels like it's designed to make things impossible yet possible but yet difficult enough that people won't actually figure it out according to the new complaint the lawsuit actually stemmed in part from a 2018 report by that it found google continued to track users even after they explicitly changed a privacy setting telling it not to by collecting information or local location information from other google products now while google defended itself in a statement to the ap at the time newly unredacted evidence in the lawsuit indicates that even some employees felt the company's settings or deceptive. Quote, I agree with the article. Location off should mean location off, not except for this case or that case, one employee said. Now, this is not the first time Google has faced legal scrutiny over how it collects and uses data. Now, last December, months after slapping the company with a third multi-billion dollar fine in just three years, the European Union opened an antitrust investigation into how Google leveraged data. Now, this just proves that privacy will continue to drive conversations for people and organizations and that this won't be the last we hear about organizations needing to pivot to handle the concerns. I guess what I'm saying is be proactive with your company and stay ahead of the curve. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, we have the bites. But before we get to the bites, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Salesforce Service Cloud. Now, you all know I love CRM. I am a CRM person. I can tell you that. And there's a reason Salesforce Service Cloud is the number one customer service platform in the world. It really does empower organizations to deliver service from anywhere at any time. Now, Salesforce Service Cloud wants you to be prepared during these unknown times. They understand that you're trying to do more with less resources and you're hustling to adapt to new customer needs and innovating your business to respond to the current environment. Now, the goal here is to satisfy your customers. And that's why you look for platforms that easily meet their needs. Well, Salesforce provides turnkey solutions, but they also have out of the box to fully customizable support. Now, customizations and platforms are near and dear to my heart and Salesforce does it very, very well. It, well, it really helps you find the best solution for your customers, or even build the best solution for your customers. Now, Service Cloud allows you to rapidly respond to customer needs on any channel. Think about all the channels you have. You have chat, SMS, WhatsApp, Facebook, Messenger, and more from whether you're at home or in the field or even in the office. You can provide instant support with self-service portals, connect customers to articles or account information, community members to find the answers they need instantly. Work smarter with built-in AI. Embed all AI-powered chatbots to help resolve customer issues quickly. Give your service team help. Give them the tools to provide an unforgettable customized customer experience. Resolve cases faster while using the suite of intelligent productivity tools, giving agents a complete shared view of every customer and interaction. And you can utilize the capability of personalizing every customer conversation and allow them to actually respond with the right level of service. Built on a fast, flexible sales platform, Salesforce Service Cloud enables Trailblazers to provide world-class service anytime, anywhere, whether it's messaging, chat, phone, self-service, or even in person. Over 150,000 companies keep their customers happy 
with Salesforce. Provide your customer service agents with a fast and flexible service platform that keeps them and your customers happy. Go to bit.ly slash Salesforce for service to find how the world's number one service platform can help grow your business. That's bit.ly slash Salesforce for service. And we thank Salesforce Service Cloud for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's now time for the bites. Now, Apple is enhancing their OSs to shut down and, and actually help with privacy and security criticisms in today's market. Well, Facebook is not too happy about that. They're warning developers that privacy changes in an upcoming OI iOS update will severely curtail its ability to track users' availability and activity across the entire Internet. And that might be bad for their ad business. We'll, we'll talk about that. Now, this next version of Apple's mobile operating system, iOS 14, is expected to hit iPhone, iPhone near you this fall. Now, along with it, it's many new consumer-facing features. Obviously, iOS 14 requires app developers to notify users if their app collects a unique device code known as an IDFA or ID for advertisers. Now, the IDFA is a randomly generated code that Apple actually assigns to a device. Now, Google assigns similar numbers to Android devices as well. Now, apps can then use these codes to tie them together and tie user activity to it. For example, Facebook, a local shopping app, um, and a local weather app might also access that identifier to know that you're, you're work, work, working through all these sites and they work together on this. So Facebook and other advertiser businesses could then use that cross app, use that data to place targeted ads for advertisers on their apps, which is what Facebook does when it's audience network program, with its audience network program. Now, Less advertising here means less money for Facebook. Now, that's where I want to get into it. Curtis, I want to throw this to you because the company is certainly worried that users will not opt in to having their identifier tracked when presented with the option in the near future. Does this mean certain doom for Facebook? Is it time to pivot? I think it's going to mean some changes for Facebook, and basically what they may have to do is find ways to provide incentive for people to provide their information. You know, so far, they've basically depended upon the basic features of Facebook and individual ignorance to, to let this personalization and information gathering take place. Now they're going to have to be a lot more explicit about why the individual user should do it. You know, I've noticed recently that a number of companies that have been asking for my data have started to, to say, you know, we can personalize the information that comes to you in ads rather than you getting all of these ads you don't care about. I think we're going to see language like that a lot more often moving forward. I agree. I want to throw this to Chibert because Chibert, you know, I seem to believe that this is not really a problem for us, right? This is actually a good thing for us. Well, geez, six one half a dozen the other. I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, I I don't like getting deluged by ads, but there has been several times when I, you know, been kind of looking around trying to solve a problem, uh, and then suddenly I get an ad for a competing product or a product in that particular um, market space. It's like, that's actually a better solution for what I need. So it has been really handy. Now, it can be taken too far. I mean, just look at how crazy it was when Decker was walking through that um, shopping center or mall in Blade Runner, you know, where ads were getting thrown in his face. So it can be taken too far. And IDFAs, um, you know, they're, they are useful. I really would like it, you know, like right now, I cannot be 100% sure that if I go into um, incognito mode, that my IDFA is not still shared. Um, at one time, it wasn't. But I'm not sure about that right now. It's maybe something I might want to do one of the day, put a sniffer on there and find out for sure. But on the other hand, if I flip the coin around, these ads are the reason why a lot of these services are free. You know, like we all we all get spammed for things like classmates.com. That's not a free service. 
Facebook, which does a lot of, you know, keeping me together with people that I know, that is still a free service. But if they can't sell ads, will it go behind a paywall? Don't know. Well, it ought to be interesting. So I am of two minds. I would like less ads, but I also don't like having to do paywalls. So I think I'm going to sit on the fence on this one. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think the interesting thing here is obviously a lot of sites today, they they track with cookies, right? So I think that you now you have this initiative from the EU that says, hey, you need to let users know what you're tracking and give them options to opt out or tell them they have some required cookie tracking for your site. And most users, they just click OK. They're just like, oh, yeah, whatever. Like, I'm fine with it, whatever. Um, but this also means, you know, from an iOS perspective, it sounds like they're following suit with that. Very similar. Uh, you know, one feature I really like from Firefox actually is they actually have a feature that says, hey, we're blocking that Facebook tracking thing. It's an explicit Facebook feature built into Firefox right now. Um, so it's it's like iOS was kind of the last line of defense here that would allow that required some kind of service or um, iOS or iOS OS update to force blocking this. And I think they just seem to be following suit. But Curtis, I want to throw you this to you for the last question. Now, Chebert brought it up. Hey, you know, there might need to be something else like a paywall or something that's required here. Is this maybe going to force users slash sites to log in, you know, users to log in more maybe to, to be, be able to track them a little bit easier? Well, I think in one sense, it's interesting the way that the wheel of karma rolls around because what the services like Facebook may be about to experience is the same kind of disruption that they visited upon print publishers a couple of decades ago. You know, it, the old saying is that if you're not paying for a service, you are the service. Or if you're not paying for a product, you are the product. Um, and so people will have to understand that their information is what has paid for these services they use. Now, I'm all for personal information being fungible. In other words, if you want to exchange your information for a service, that should be your right. The issue is you knowingly and explicitly making that exchange. We've had, to this point, a lot of unknowing exchange of personal data for a service. Now that's going to be a more knowing, more explicit thing, and we get to find out just how much people value their personal information and the services that networks like Facebook, Instagram, and the rest provide. Right. Well, I think that puts that one to bed. I'm, I'm actually not excited to see how Facebook uh, will solve this challenge because they might do it in a very creative way. We'll have to see. Well, this year has been nothing sort of strange, and it's forcing some changes in the market, especially redefining different roles out there. Curtis, how, how has the role changed for CISOs? Well, you know, that's, that's interesting. A recent study from the Enterprise Strategy Group found that the average CISO tenure is two to four years. Now, I can remember back in the 90s when the average CIO tenure was about that long, and coincidentally, the average CIO tenure was roughly the same as the length of a deployment cycle for an ERP package. It would seem that today there's a wide variety of contributing factors regarding why so many security professionals last less than a thousand days in their role. Now, among them are the fact that the role and expectations are different from company to company. Many organizations face an ever-evolving security and risk strategy, which can change key competencies required for success. And over more than a decade in the security industry, we have seen that this gray area, this changing expectation and constantly shifting um, set of competencies can have a lot to do with why someone will succeed or fail in a particular CISO role. 
publicity around major data breaches and compliance requirements, ongoing discussions of privacy and data rights like the one we just have, have opened the eyes of a lot of C-suites and executive boards. And this has highlighted the critical nature of the CISO role. You know, at one time, the CISO simply reported to the CIO and no one else in the C-suite were aware that there was such a role. Now, the CISO frequently finds themselves making presentations to the board because of compliance and public relations issues regarding personal information, privacy, and security. It's not realistic when you get down to it to imagine and expect a CISO to be some sort of omnipotent cybersecurity demigod. Now, they should be able, expected to help shape the company's security investment priorities, be able to help align the corporate defined objectives with the security priorities, but within reason. You know, we've heard so often in the last, oh, half dozen to, to 10 years that CISOs are business executives, which means that they are expected to have core competencies in all of the accounting and business techniques and expertise areas, along with the expertise in security and especially cybersecurity. Is it realistic for the modern day CISO to balance the heavy demands placed on them? Or is it time to start looking at dividing the CISO's role into multiple jobs? You know, a physical security expert, a cybersecurity expert, someone who focuses on privacy. We've already seen this in some companies as they add a chief privacy officer to the chief information security officer. At the end of the day, it's important that the security community and business leaders work together to actively shape and ensure success in the CISO role. Now, one of the questions I want to ask my co-host, and Lou, I'm going to come to you first. Is this part of an ongoing shift in the nature of many business roles, or is this kind of shift something that's unique to the CISO role? Have have you noticed shifts going on in the roles and expectations of some of the, the, the business management and administration roles uh, that you see out there in the, in the world? Absolutely. I think it's, this has impacted pretty much every level, every layer of organizations out there, whether it's, you know, in, in my organization, whether it's developing software that's more secure, that's focused on privacy, that's focused on doing the right thing with users' data. That's really an important thing. And that that happens at the lowest level. It's when you're building a feature all the way up to, you know, to an executive level to ensure that their organization's doing the right thing and the right thing for their customers. And so I think it's it's definitely impacted every layer and things continue to pivot. Like obviously there's no, new newer compliance out there. There's newer rules. There's new policies. Um, there's different markets, whether you're in government markets or your education markets. And so different roles have to deal with different things. Um, you, know, you know, I was talking to a representative, a person that works on the Microsoft Teams group recently. Um, and they were saying they're working with education. And obviously because of all the changes that are happening with remote education, uh, and of course, a lot of a lot of schools and, and 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 communities have very specific needs, as well as different rules and guidelines they need to follow, and so the applications need to follow suit with that. And that's that happens at the at the feature level all the way up to the service and and beyond. So I, I definitely think this is going to continue to force uh, organizations to pivot and evolve over time. Well. Brian, I, I know that you have a, a long career that uh, you're shifting some of your roles. So let me ask you, when you see all of this shifting and changing going on, do you see this as a good thing? Or do you think that we and our organizations would be better served if there was some real constancy in what was expected of a particular job title? You know, I'm not sure I'm really qualified um, to answer that, because I've actively, actively avoided managerial positions. 
Uh, I'm a great team leader, but I stink as a manager. Now, having said that, uh, one of my biggest complaints about these so-called um, higher ups, the rarefied territory of the C-suite, is that too many of them don't know how to do the job in the trenches. Um, that's been my number one complaint. I'd rather see them come up through the um, the ranks so that they actually understand how the job is done or why we're doing it. Um, so I, I would say, you know, someone needs to start off learning how to do it. And then the managers need to be the why we do it. Now, having said that, you know, th it's hard. You know, these um, every CISO I've ever met or any CISO that's um, I've heard about, these poor schmucks, male or female or whatever, um, have big honking targets on their back. And the stress of those jobs must be insane. So the turnover has got to be really high. Otherwise, you burn your people out. So I don't know. Um, I'd love to see um, the folks in the C-suite actually know how to do the job. That might be a really old-fashioned um, attitude. But I've seen some really, really stupid mandates coming down from the C-suite that it's pretty obvious they didn't talk to people that know how to do the job. So I don't think I really answered your question, but <laughs> maybe I did. It was a really good answer. As you say, I'm not sure it was to the question I asked, but it's a great answer. And uh, we appreciate that. Uh, you know, this is one of those things in my career. I have watched a lot of titles be created I've watched a lot of titles change in what they are expected to do, largely because the technology was changing. There is technology at play in the business marketplace now that just wasn't there when I began my career. I think that's going to continue. And so there's an extent to which I think this change in definition and change in priority is inevitable because the business titles, the business responsibilities have to respond to what surrounds the business and makes it happen. It's going to give us plenty to talk about, and we've got lots more to talk about even today. And so, Lou, I'm going to turn it back over to you to get us headed off in that direction. Thank you, Curtis. Well, the next part of the show is my favorite part of the show. We get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the twilight. Right? Before we get to that, we have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is Security Scorecard. Now, with all the organizations I work with, I can tell you that they're always looking for ways to audit themselves and grade their cyber risk. Now, especially in the way the current climate is and the ever-changing security landscape. Now, Security Scorecard is the global leader in cybersecurity ratings and the only service with one and a half million companies continuously rated. Now, their mission is to empower every organization with collaborative security intelligence because you are only as secure as those who you work with. Now, Security Scorecard helps enterprises manage digital threats with a 360 degree view of cybersecurity health through a single pane of glass. Now, they have a patented rating technology used by over a thousand organizations for multiple use cases. Now, listen to these. You can evaluate your organization's cybersecurity risk using data driven, objective, and continuously evolving metrics that provide visibility into your organization's information security control weaknesses. Now, with their security card rating systems, that will help you. Now, you can instantly view the cybersecurity posture of any third-party vendor, partner, or supplier to help you evaluate your risk in your entire ecosystem. It can also allow them to find and fix cybersecurity risks and vulnerabilities across their externally facing digital footprint as well with their third-party risk management. And they also are used for board and executive level reporting in the insurance space for cyber insurance underwriting. Now, Security Scorecard is always working for you behind the scenes. They have non-intrusively collect data from publicly available feeds across the internet for an outside-in perspective. They actually use that data. It's used to calculate scores across 10 key risk factor groups, such as patching maintenance, application security, DNS health, security, network security, and endpoint security. Now, an A to F grading scale helps companies actually easily understand and continuously monitor their grade and their cybersecurity posture of any organization. Now, companies with a C 
D or F grade are five times more likely to be breached. That's pretty high. Now, Security Scorecard has also their Atlas service. It's the leading cybersecurity questionnaire and validation solution. It cuts through all the questionnaire noise so you can find out your score to make your business cyber secure. Now, Atlas's centralized platform leverages machine learning to automate the cybersecurity questionnaire process for senders and receivers, making it two times faster, more accurate, and more secure. Now, Atlas is the only platform in the market that instantly maps cybersecurity rating data to individual responses, providing a 360-degree view of risk. Now, cut the questionnaire cycle in half, save hours with 20-plus industry standard questionnaires or their custom questionnaire wizard. Collaborate easily and secure with your team and third parties. Now, Security Scorecard believes that every business has a right to its own cybersecurity rating. They were awarded best product for security ratings by 2020 SC Magazine Awards. Now, I hope you've been listening because Security Scorecard is something all organizations should be using to assess their risk. The combined power of Security Scorecard ratings and Atlas gives organizations a 360-degree view of cybersecurity for any company in the world. Sign up for a free account by visiting securityscorecard.com slash twit. Check the score of your business and up to five others. To learn more and sign up for your free account, visit securityscorecard.com slash twit. And we thank Security Scorecard for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it brings us to the, my favorite part of the show, where you actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twy Ryan. Today, we have Darren Deacon. He is the Chief Availability Officer of Salesforce. Welcome to the show, Darren. Thank you very much, Lou. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. We're really excited about this because this is a new role, and we're going to get to that because we really want to talk about it. But first, our audience loves origin stories. They love to feel people's journey through tech. Can you maybe take us through a short journey and what brought you to Salesforce? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, I went to a small school, a liberal arts school in Nebraska, uh, got a degree in computer science and business administration. My first job, uh, I, I put a classified ad in the newspaper and I wrote business software for a lot of small companies. Uh, I was in consulting for a while. I was in telecommunications for a while, writing uh, a lot of uh, different types of business systems. I was at Microsoft. I spent 21 years there in a number of different roles. I started out in their evangelism team, working with a lot of the large partners. I worked in Windows for a long time. Uh, I worked in Bing. Uh, that's where I got a lot of my distributed systems experience. I worked in Azure, um, pretty much worked in, in all parts of the engineering teams at, at Microsoft, except for Xbox and gaming. And then I've been at Salesforce for three years, a little three and a half years. Um, and I've been in uh, more of the infrastructure side, um, leading a lot of the infrastructure engineering, infrastructure planning, uh, site reliability teams, and now a lot of our high availability and, and reliability efforts. Right, right. Now, although Salesforce is an advertiser, we thought this was an exciting announcement. We wanted to start with this first. Like you said, you've been in the infra for many years, but Salesforce felt the need to create this new role to focus solely on availability. Can you maybe take us through the reason of the new role and what it means? Yeah, absolutely. You know, at, at Salesforce, we talk about trust as our number one value. Uh, and it means a lot of different things. It means customers trust us to build the capabilities that, that they need to manage their business, uh, whether that's in marketing or CRM or analytics. Um, it means that, you know, the, the CISO discussion we just had, it means making sure the data is secure. Uh, but it also means that uh, it's always available. Uh, no matter what uh, the case is. And it means that as we work with our customers, uh, that we're transparent and collaborative with our customers. Uh, customers are betting their businesses on Salesforce. So we felt it was important to have this particular role that really, number one, worked with customers to understand their expectations. But then number two has brought it back into Salesforce and made sure that we were building the right solutions. We had the right architectures in place. Uh, we had the right support systems in place. We had the right communication and engagement model with those customers to deliver on, uh, excuse me, on those expectations. Right. Right. I mean, like you said, I mean, lot, we know a lot of businesses out there that depend on Salesforce for their full scam of business. Uh, like you said, service sales more. 
like I want to ask, what what do you see? What are the current challenges you see there in focus right now? Obviously, because you're new to the role, but you've been working in the industry for a while. But there's got to be something in focus. What are you guys going to focus on first? Yeah, great question. There's kind of two or three big things I would say. Number one is um, realizing that the expectations of customers is increasing. Uh, we have a number of emergency response systems that are companies that are running on our platform. We have healthcare uh, services that are running on our platform. Uh, if doctors aren't able to see patient records, if we're not able to prescribe medications, uh, if customers aren't ready or, or able to go in and, and uh, get reimbursed for those or, or order the prescriptions, that's a real problem. And so really understanding, engaging with the community to understand what are those requirements, I think is number one. Number two then is we need to realize that the complexity of all these systems is increasing exponentially on multiple dimensions. Uh, you look at our systems, uh, we started out in CRM and now we're in uh, B2C commerce, we're in marketing, we're in analytics, there's integration. Uh, we're, we're taking our, our services and breaking them into microservices, so things are much more distributed. But Salesforce is not just a set of products, it's a platform. It's a platform that businesses use to create custom workflows, to create custom data models, uh, to create custom applications. And the integration between the Salesforce apps, the Salesforce platform, and what customers are doing is getting more and more complex. And so really, my job is to understand what those complexities are and to make sure that we're constantly staying ahead of, of where our customers are and make sure we're designing the right systems. We anticipate and prepare for those problems to make sure that we're able to withstand any uh, you know types of issues, to make sure that when there is an issue, and there will, that the way we respond, the way we recover um, is is hand in hand with our customers, with our ISV partners and with others. And then also just as important, we evolve and learn because just like in security, things will go wrong. And as we have issues, we, we do root cause analysis, we learn, we understand what mitigations need to take place, we get those implemented and, and we all move on. So that those are some of the things that are top of mind for me right now. Yeah, and our chat room is at the buzz here. They're saying, yeah, integration is really hard. And I kind of want to get into that a little bit. Salesforce brings a lot of value. And one of the biggest values actually is also that it's a platform. You can build on it. You can extend it. You can integrate it with other services. And you talked a little bit about ISVs. How That's got to be a big challenge, right? Because you're now integrating with other services, with other places to store data. With, you know, to, And people will judge Salesforce based off of how well they integrate and if those services are also available as they're using Salesforce. W where do you see that going? Where, how are you going to manage that challenge? Yeah, that's, you know, the ISV community is one of the real strengths of Salesforce is, you know, like I said, every business is, is different. There's no two that have the same workflows or have the same data models. It's all about being able to customize it and ISVs play an important part. One of the big things we're doing internally is we want to make sure that every service, every feature has clearly defined bar of what is the expectation for availability? What are those SLOs? Uh, which isn't just about uptime. It's about performance. It's about response time. It's about data, um, you know, integrity, data recoverability if something goes wrong. So it really starts with having the right SLOs. Then making sure you have the right telemetry in place so that you can observe what's happening uh, in real time. Um, and you have alerts that can fire when things go out of bounds, when things are going wrong, uh, you can alert uh, the right people and respond to those. Um, and then it's making sure that as those alerts fire, the right people are, are able to respond in the right way. They have the right information to respond and, and to recover. That's no different internally than what we do with our ISV partners is we want to make sure that we're clear on what is the, the level of uh, uh, availability. What are those SLOs that we all aspire to achieve to? Uh, do we have the right telemetry in place with our ISV partners? Do we have the right alerting? And that's a two-way street. Uh, because a lot of times our partners will see things before we do. So 
having a, an ability to share metrics, to share log data, to have alerts fire in both directions is a really important part of, you know, being a platform vendor in, in this day and age. Right. And it's interesting because, you know, my my day in CRM, we I we used to build a service that allowed you to integrate with your email. And so some people had this expectation that, hey, if I track something in my email, it's going to show up in CRM or Salesforce pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, there's that kind of connection, that expectation that customers have. Are you seeing that the expectation is shifting, especially in the current climate when there's higher cybersecurity risk and other things from customers? Yeah, absolutely. The expectation is shifting on a number of fronts. If, if you look at what's happening today with everyone working from home, ordering things from home, you know, it, integration is more important than ever. Um, you know, you think about the, the digital transformation journey that companies are going through. It's how do you reach your customers? How do you connect with those customers? Then whether you're in a B2B or a B2C, you know, type of environment, how do you then go engage with those customers? How are you going to connect with them if you're a sales rep? What's your retail uh, e-commerce experience? Um, you want to then look at the support model of how do you support those customers if they buy things? How do you connect those with other systems, uh, your ERP systems, your analytical models, all those types of things? So. The systems are getting much more interconnected, and I think as we go through this digital transformation, that is really one of the key benefits that digital brings is we are able to integrate these things together. We're able to see a complete picture, but that is also part of the complexity that we need to design for and that we need to actively manage. Right. So one more before I, I wanted to add again. Um, one. Things that I'm noticing is obviously globally, there's a lot of challenges. Obviously, there's network connectivity. There's you know different levels of connectivity around the world. What is Salesforce seeing? What are some of the challenges, especially around availability there? Yeah, I, I think network is um, one of the big sources, and it's changing. When you think about COVID and, and people working from home, there's a huge impact uh, one example, I, you, you talked a little bit earlier about service cloud. Um, we've uh, our service cloud managed large call centers where generally you'd have hundreds or even thousands of people co-located into one one large facility. You had high bandwidth connectivity coming in. You had good power. You know everyone was in the same room. And now those hundreds or thousands of call center people are being distributed and taking calls from their home. So when you think about the network, when you think about performance, when you think about availability, you know that's changed. Uh, I think we need to now think about proximity. How do we take our services and make sure that um, we put them as close to the customer as we can? I think we need to have edge networking so that we're able to route traffic in, in a very efficient way. Uh, you mentioned DDoS attacks when you were talking about security. The, the better we can we can detect those DDoS attacks on the edge, shed them off of the network, You know, the better the quality of the network's gonna be. Um, and that network is getting more and more complex. Um, the security model around networks, the connectivity between all the different ISPs is getting more and more complex as well. So we spend a huge amount of, of time and effort uh, automating as much of that as we can, uh, bringing in the right telemetry from some of our partners so that we can see issues as, as quickly as possible. So there's a huge amount of investment going on in, in the network. That is one of the hardest things that we manage. Right, right. Well, when we come back, we have a lot more to talk about. I also want to bring my co-host back in. But before we get to that, I do want to thank another great sponsor of this weekend, Enterprise Tech, and that's Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Now, you're probably already storing data. It could be either on-prem or already in the cloud. Well, if you're considering cloud storage, think about this. Wasabi is 80% cheaper than Amazon S3 and significantly cheaper than on-premise storage. Now, typically, you can actually store data in Wasabi's cloud for less than just an annual cost of the maintenance fees on the same amount of on-prem storage. Now, Wasabi's disruptive price performance model makes buying cloud store storage a natural addition. Now, in fact, if you're a managed service provider, Wasabi is the perfect solution for you to sell because you can earn more 
while charging less. Now, there are actually two ways to pay here. You can pay as you go or you can pay one time with reserved capacity storage. Now, Wasabi's reserved capacity storage makes buying cloud storage a natural addition to your on-prem storage. If you're thinking about buying more hardware storage, compare that price against five years of reserved capacity storage. You'll actually be surprised. You can purchase cloud storage in one three or five year increments and achieve greater discounts for term and capacity. Now with Wasabi security is often even greater than on-premise storage here. Now it provides 11 nines of durability, 11 nines. This means on average, you'll lose one file every 649,000 years. So you're not going to lose a file now hosted in premier tier four data centers facilities. They are highly secure, fully redundant, and Wasabi is secure by default because all the data stored in Wasabi cloud is always encrypted at rest even if that requesting party doesn't even specify encryption. Now, Wasabi follows industry best security models and design practices. They have access control me mechanisms such as bucket policies and, and access control lists can actually be used to selectively grant permissions to things. Now, your data will be immutable because it'll be preventing data from being erased or altered, and you'll be protected from hackers, malware, and even yourself. That's right. You don't want to delete things. Now, Wasabi has active integrity checking where all objects stored are checked for integrity every 90 days. And if you're worried about compliance, they're HIPAA, FINRA, and CGIS compliant as well. In fact, Wasabi is not just highly secure, disruptive technology that's turning the industry upside down and on its ear. It's the storage that's 80% cheaper and act actually six times faster than the speed of the industry leader. Now, if you're ready to reduce your cogs and get all the things you need, both performant, compliant, and secure, go try Wasabi right now. Go build something great. Calculate the savings for yourself and start with a free trial of storage for a month. Go to wasabi.com, click the free trial link and enter the code enterprise. Join the movement and migrate your data to the cloud with confidence. Go to wasabi.com and make sure you use the offer code enterprise. And we thank Wasabi for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Darren Deacon. He's the chief availability officer over there at Salesforce. We have a really great discussion. Lots of things to talk about here. I do want to bring my co-host back in because they've been chomping at the bit here behind the scenes to ask some questions. Chibert, I want to throw it to you first. Well, I'm interested in the what are the challenges going forward? You know, things are changing. The pandemic has certainly changed the way we do business. My question revolves around we're trying to provide more services, more availability of getting people the answers. And to that end, we're, I'm seeing lots and lots of people throwing more and more AI. But isn't this depersonalizing the availability movement? Well, <clears throat> I don't know if it's depersonalizing the availability movement. Um, I think AI has a great place to play in availability. Um, there's so much data, so much telemetry coming in that sometimes it's hard to see the prover proverbial needle in a haystack. So we're using AI to go in and detect anomalies, to detect issues, you know, before uh, a human could. Uh, so I think there's absolutely a place for that. But in terms of, of, you know, what's changing, we've talked about availability for a long time. We've talked about uh, BCP and disaster recovery and things like that as an industry for, I don't know, 20, 30 years at least. Um, I think one of the hardest challenges is really a cultural change because uh, where we are today is very different than maybe where we were even six months ago, certainly where we were a few years ago. Uh, we talked about the complexity, but one of the challenges that I have with, with COVID right now is, you know, how do I manage such a distributed, you know, um, engineering team? How do I manage an SRE team that used to all be together in the same place and be able to work together? How do I manage my engineering team that now has to be on call when they're balancing so many other priorities and they're working from home? How do I manage the complexity where as we move more and more into Kubernetes and microservices that, you know, the, the individual teams uh, have to make sure that they have all the right things in place. Do they have the right telemetry? Do they have the right alerts? So part of that is a cultural problem. Part of that is how do you go through that cultural uh, kind of evolution, if you will, and make sure that all of your systems with people working from home and being more distributed, your services are more distributed. How do you manage a culture to make sure that you continue to have high availability and you can continue to increase it and meet those customer expectations? 
It's true. I do want to throw over to Kurt because Kurt has some questions too. Kurt? Well, one of the things that, that I think is really interesting for someone who is in charge of reliability at a company like Salesforce is that there are so many partner organizations that are that are part of what your customers experience and what they pay for. So my my real question is when you're defining your job, just how much of that total customer experience can can you really be chief of? When you're when you're you're talking about reliability, do you have to just place your faith in a lot of these third-party organizations, or do you get to help them be more available and more reliable as well? Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you an example. I was talking to a customer uh, just last week in Australia, a very big customer who was not only using Salesforce, but they were using several of our ISV partners to provide kind of different uh, add-ons on top of Salesforce. And, you know, Salesforce was very secure, was very available, everything was going fine, but those third-party ISV solutions were not. Um, and they were saying, Darren, you know, what do I do here? You know, I bought Salesforce. That's part of your ecosystem. And I said, look, let me engage. Uh, so I went and talked to the ISV. And I said, hey, here's what I'm seeing. I have log data here that shows how many different incidents are, are happening. I have different metrics. And, and I shared that with them. And they're like, you know, they weren't aware of some of these things. They weren't aware of the customer feedback. They weren't aware of some of the quality issues. And I think that's something that we can partner together on. So I do think about my role as, you know, representing not only Salesforce, but our partner community and our hardware community back to the network, as well as what the customers need. And I think much like in security, you know, you look at CISO, CISO's job is not just about working inside their company, but it's about working across the community and sharing information, sharing best practices, uh, working with their customers to understand what's going on. And I think in my in my role as chief availability officer, it's it's very similar in that way. You know, you, you mentioned something uh, that you did in that last response where you helped provide a partner with visibility into to what they were doing. How much of your job is visibility? You know, that's a, that's a word that we keep hearing people use, especially in the context of cloud-based applications. And it is stunning how many organizations, CIOs, CISOs, other top executives have, seem to have very little visibility into what their infrastructure is like and, and what their infrastructure is doing. You know, how important is this idea of visibility to what you do and does Salesforce do things to provide visibility that are profoundly different than what a lot of other organizations do? Yeah, I think visibility, it's a big word, but I think in some ways it's one of the most important things that we do. Um, first of all, we need visibility just into how things are working. If you don't have the right telemetry in place throughout the entire uh, system, you're, you're just going to be flying blind. And so having that telemetry in place is, is important. Having the telemetry in place with your partners and what your customers are doing um, is, is very important. But also having telemetry come back from uh, or visibility come back from your customers is, is just as important. Um, I spend a huge amount of my time with customers, understanding what are they doing, how are they doing it, uh, another example, I was talking to one of our largest customers a couple weeks ago, and you know we were trying to debug some issues together because it was a very complex integration between a number of components. And the thing we found was they were running on a very old version of a browser. And that old, you know, we had really, Salesforce had no other customers. So I was able to go look and say, okay, what other customers were using that browser? We weren't able to find hardly any, and we were able to trace it down. So I think that's the type of collaboration that Salesforce wants to have with our customers. I think that's really, when Salesforce talks about trust as our number one value, those are some of the things that we really mean and why we created this particular role. 
Well, unfortunately, all good things have to come to an end and it went really fast because we had a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. But Darren, thank you so much for being here. We're running a little bit low on time. I do want to give you a chance maybe to tell the folks at home where they can go learn more about Salesforce, maybe even learn about some of the transparency things that you guys are doing around availability. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Well, first of all, Lou, thank you for inviting me and, and Curtis and Brian as well. It was an honor to be here uh, and to be able to talk about this particular role. I think, you know, we take trust, we take availability very seriously. If you go to salesforce.com, uh, there's a lot of great information. Trust.salesforce.com is our trust site that talks about a lot of the things around security, availability, you know, and other things around that. We have our blog where my team tries to publish a lot of great information, not just about how we're doing, but what we're doing. Uh, a lot of the investments we're making and things like that. So those are all great uh, kind of forums for, for more information um, uh, as well. So uh, hopefully that's helpful. Again, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Thanks again. Well, folks, you've done it again. You've set up another hour of the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. So tune your device to Twilight. But I do want to make make sure I thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-hosts. They are my team. They are really I really couldn't do this show without him. So I want to start with our very own Mr. Brian Chi. He's the geek in paradise. Chibert, now that you've closed up your 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 lab there, what's next? What are you doing in the coming weeks? <laughs> Packing. <laughs> Actually, my first um Packing pod is arriving tomorrow, and uh, I guess that's the first really big step to moving from one side of the nation to the other. I'm going from the westernmost side to the easternmost, and eventually I'll be in the same town as um, Curtis. Anyway, I still want to hear from you no matter what, even if I'm in transit. I am ADVNETLAB on Twitter or you're more than welcome to drop me an email. I am Chebert at twit.tv, or better yet, why don't you use twiet at twit.tv, and that'll hit all the hosts. We'd love to hear your ideas, and trust me, I'm getting lots of great ideas, lots of PR agents, lots of uh, viewers sending show ideas. Keep them coming. This is going to be a lot of fun, and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Chebert. Well, we also have to thank Mr. Curtis Franklin. He's the senior editor over there at Dark Reading. Curtis, what's going on with you in the coming weeks and where can people find you? Well, I'm going to keep writing about cybersecurity issues for Dark Reading and especially the edge of Dark Reading. I've got a new piece up about how you can recognize if your supply chain is vulnerable. Uh, it is a... a I thought a pretty cool little article uh, looks at some obvious and some not so obvious things. Check it out. It's over there on the edge. And uh, next time I'm on Twiet, I think I'm going to have some news about uh, more things I'm going to be doing. So uh, stay tuned. Lots of good stuff happening and uh, looking forward to sharing it with the Twiet Riot. Ooh, I love the tease. We're looking forward to it. Thanks, Curtis. Well, folks, we also want to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch and to listen to our show to get your enterprise goodness. We want to make it easy for you to watch and listen, catch up on your enterprise news for the week. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information, guest information, and also the links that we do during the show. But more importantly, next to those videos there, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice. Listen on any one of your devices or on any one of your podcast applications. We're on all of them, Podcatch or Apple Podcasts, YouTube, you name it. Subscribe. It's really the best way to support the show and stay on top of your enterprise and IT news after you subscribe. Impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with the gift of Twiet. We talk about some fun tech topics here, and I can definitely guarantee they it would be interesting to them as well. So if you if not, reach out and say, hey, we want to find some more interesting things. Go to Twiet at twit.tv. It's a really great way to to reach out. Of course, we also have the twit.community website, and of course, you can always reach me at luamm Twitter at Twitter. So check that out and reach out. Now, if you've already subscribed and you are available during the day, 1.30 p.m. Pacific on Fridays, we do the show live. That's right. Come see how the pizza's made. Come see the behind the scenes at live 
twit.tv. It's live right now on the stream. We love having a, a good time here and we love doing the banter before the show. So come check that out. And of course, if you're going to watch the show live, you might as well jump into the chat room as, as well. We had a really great set of characters in there today. We had some great questions and topics that came from there. So check that out as well. IRC.twit.tv. And of course, you can't, if you're not part of the live show and you can't be part of the live chat, there's also the twit.community website out there. It's a great way to have a 24-7 discussion about technology, about the shows with the, with the hosts and the co-hosts. So definitely go out there and check that as well. Remember, you can always follow me, twitter.com slash LouMM. There I post all the greatest and greatest ways uh, about what, how I'm actually working at Microsoft as well as customizing your office experience. Of course, all my enterprise tidbits are posted out there and I have some really great conversations with people like you. Now, also, I actually want to thank everyone who makes this show possible. Couldn't do this show without the people at Twit, especially thank you to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support us each and every week, and we really thank you for all their support. We also want to thank all the engineers at Twit. Of course, we also want to thank Mr. Brian Chi one more time. Chibert, he's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer, and he does all the bookings and the plannings for the show. And we really just we couldn't do the show without him. So thanks again, Chibert, for all your support. Really appreciate it, especially during packing times. And before we sign out, we have to thank our TD for today. He's also our editor. He's Mr. Victor. Victor, how are things hey. going, man? And uh, how's your wife? She's good. Uh, we're getting close to having another little one. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, that would, might have been an odd question for me to ask until you said about the little one. So Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Victor, how's your wife? <laughs> What? That's I'm great. Kidding. I'm really glad to um, hear. <laughs> no. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks for asking. But it's glad to, it's good to be back. Um, and always glad to to work with you guys on this show. Always have a good time. Thanks, Victor. Appreciate it. Well, until next time, I'm Louis Moresca, just reminding you: if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. One more twit. Well, you got to check out iOS Today. That's the show where Leo Laporte and I cover everything you need to know about iOS. It's the best apps, the best games, and everything you can do with your iPad, your iPhone, and your Apple Watch, plus car kit and so much more. Twit.tv slash iOS.